Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining this Zoogler Community Meetup uh, with Brandon P. Fleming. I the pleasure of meeting him in Israel in January and then also in New York uh, in July and had an opportunity to really read his book uh, as I was on a very long flight. Um, it's called Miseducated. And once I got off the plane, I finished reading before I saw him in New York. I was so excited. And I went up to him and said, look, I have so many questions to ask you. I benefited so much from reading it, learning from him and it really has inspired me to focus more on Zugla School and a lot of different education initiatives. So I feel uh, privileged to be able to ask uh, Brandon on to speak to the Zugla community, but also have this recording available for others who aren't able to join us live. But why don't I do a quick intro of, uh, for him and then we can go into some of the questions that I have and some, some things that Brandon could share as well. So the reason why we're here is Brandon ha has this remarkable talent to share from his own background and wanting to share with the entire world, but really from what I heard to share with his kids as he's now a teacher and instructor and wants to really inspire and bring essentially the next generation of leaders into the next phase. And what I really liked about the book is how open he was. There was a lot of pain that he went through, but uh, his single focus was what can you do for his kids? And so when I read that, I saw that there were so many things I could learn and also what many more people could learn and really want to get these stories out there. Um, so what Brandon is doing now, besides going all around the U.S., all around the world, talking about the book and sharing from his experience, he's also the founder and CEO of the Veritas School of Social Sciences. I'll tell, I'll get him to share more about what that is and the connection it has with Harvard University. Uh, before that, he just finished, uh, he wrapped up uh, six years as the assistant coach of debate at Harvard University. And what's really interesting is he'll share more about his time at Liberty University, his, his prior life uh, being a sports star going into university and what he did before that. It's a astounding story. And I know a lot of us have a lot to learn from him, but uh, why don't I turn it over to him to do a better intro? And then from there, I'll ask some specific questions. And also probably after about half an hour or so, we'll open up to the audience for questions. So uh, Brandon, thank you for joining the Zugla community, sharing your insights with us and welcome. And please uh, introduce yourself again, if you don't mind. Oh, man, my good brother. Thank you so much for having me. But first of all, um, I, I just want to um, express my gratitude for you creating space uh, for me here, which, which is critically important. I think what what not only what you're doing um, from a business standpoint, but also from a from from a social responsibility standpoint, because I think it's important that as we are pursuing um, business, it's important for us to to, to take a moment and pause and talk about impact. And, and, and that's what this story is, uh, is, is really about. That's what my life has been about. Uh, it's been about discovering myself. It's been about discovering my voice and, and ultimately learning what it means to help other people do the same. Um, and, and I want, before we delve into the nuances, um, for people to understand the, the, the framework for, for this journey that, that I've had, um, and, and it's really about talent cultivation, you know, and, and, and that's the reason why I'm, as an educator, you know, I, I speak primarily um, in education spaces, but I speak in a lot of corporate spaces as well, because nowadays, everybody wants to know what it means to cultivate talent. And, and, and the reason why, you know, my, my story has led me to discover, rate, uh, to, to, to discover a, a very unique approach to that is because um, I was considered the opposite of talented. <laughs> you know, when I grew up as a, as a child, you know, I was considered, um, you know, at risk, diagnosed with learning disabilities. Uh, to be honest with you, nobody in my life at the time ever imagined that I would be where I am right now. Um, to be honest with you, you, you know how usually with, um, with success stories, you know, you, you interview the, the subjects, uh, family members and friends, you know, when they grew up and, and, and people will ask them, you know, did you always know that he was going to turn out to be something great? You know, when people ask my mother that, she says very candidly, hell no, <laughs> I did not. You know, he was my worst child. I had no idea he was going to turn out the way that he did. Um, and, and the reason why that, that is important is, is, is because it, is, it says something uh, about the, the way that we perceive people, you know, in, in the world, you know, and, and do we look at people, you know, and, and see their problems or do we look at people and see their potential? You know, for me, people only saw the problems surrounding my behavior, 
um, the conditions that I grew up in, um, the environment that I was surrounded by. Um, but, but the reason why I'm here right now is because of an experience that I had with a teacher, you know, who, who demonstrated what it meant to meet me where I was, um, who understood that, that love is the greatest instrument of change. Um, and, and she was able to tap into uh, abilities within me that were latent. Um, and, and, and when that surfaced, you know, I discovered um, that I was able to fly in ways that I had not imagined and other people had not imagined. So I use those same practices. I use those same um, equitable precepts um, to be able to tap into the potential, you know, of young people and, and, and cultivate their talents as well and put them in positions where they too can fly and soar and, and show the world what's possible when the level, when the playing field is level for them. Um, so that's just a very brief introduction into, you know, kind of my story, my journey. I'm happy to answer any uh, specific questions you might have. Great. Let's start with uh, what you're doing now that you've, you're building an inspirational institution in Atlanta. Tell us more about that initially. Let's start with that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll start with with the why and and with the what. You know, when when I uh, was recruited by Harvard University back in uh, 2017, I was I was 26 years old. And uh, when when I got there, I, I recognized that there were not many students there who looked like me. Um, to give you context, at Harvard we have a summer residency for over 400 of the most gifted young scholars from over 25 countries worldwide, and none of those students were black. And I knew that was a problem and I wanted to do something about it. And so I said, you know, I want to start a pipeline program that will recruit black and brown students and, and feed them into the university summer program on full scholarship. Well, there was a concern around that because, you know, the question was, well, you know, we, we want to be more inclusive, but how do you expect to take kids from inner city Atlanta who attend under-resourced schools and bring them to Harvard to compete against the most elite debaters from around the world. Obviously, there's a learning gap. How do you expect to close that gap? How do you expect to level the playing field? And I said, I'll do it. I'll spend the whole year every Saturday teaching them philosophy, political science, sociology, psychology, all of those higher level academic disciplines that are not available to them in their traditional school settings. I said, I'm going to teach them those subjects. And next year, when they get here next, um, when they get here next summer, I'll make sure that they are ready to compete against the rest of the world. And, and so I did that um, and trained a group of 25 students, um, sent them to Harvard the next summer, and they won that competition. Um, but not only did they win the first year, um, but the second, the third, the fourth, um, and as of this past summer, even the fifth year, every year, um, every cohort that I've trained has won that competition. So what's happened? is that it created this national demand that I was not ready for, quite honestly. You know, as I traveled to different um, cities around the country, people were asking, what will you do for us, you know, here in Chicago, or what can you do for us in LA, or what can you do for our kids in Philly? You know, what can you do for our kids in New Orleans? You know, A Atlanta is not the only city um, that, that is suffering from inequality. And so people all over the country are looking for a solution, and it just so happens that I created one. And so now anytime you discover a solution, um, the next challenge is around scale. You know, how do you get it into the hands of as many people as possible? And so I had to think quickly. I was like, okay, you know, what can I do? And so we, uh, at first my idea was maybe I'll start the Harvard Diversity Project in different cities. Maybe there's a Harvard Diversity Project of Atlanta, a Harvard Diversity Project of, of Chicago and so on. Um, we did a feasibility study that wasn't feasible. And then I came up with this, I said, you know what? I'm only one person. I can't be in every place at every time. But what if instead of me going to them, what if I brought them here to Atlanta? What, what, what if I created one school, one institution that was known for leveling the playing field for Black and Brown youth, where we can create pipelines from the most unequal cities in America and bring those students here to Atlanta to receive um, an unparalleled education? Um, well, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And we just launched uh, the Veritas School of Social Sciences. Um, right now, it's currently operating as a Saturday school, as we have been operating for the past five years. Um, our students continue to go to Harvard during the summer and compete. Um, but in two years, in fall 2024, we are going to launch phase two of the Veritas School, which will be to launch a, a day school for students in Metro Atlanta. 
Um, and then after that in fall 2028, we are going to launch phase three, which is when we will scale nationally and internationally. Incredible. Congratulations. What, what a Thank you so uh, much. amazing thing you're working on. I want to go back to how you even decided to, to do all this. And even from the earliest uh, times where you did mention that teacher and instructor saw the potential in you and brought it out. And that was, that was a great, it's an amazing teacher. And for those who haven't read the book yet, it's essentially the, the circumstance where um, Brandon's mom essentially gave him the ability to go back to school on the GI Bill. And there was a time where Brandon uh, unfortunately had an injury and so couldn't actually be in the university for the sports side. And correct me if I've got the details from Brandon. And it's really the teacher that really found that potential in you. Can you share how you in the end also can identify such talented people and inspire them to go beyond their abilities, Brandon? Yeah, you know what's so amazing? I, I, I struggled when I made it to college because I was a job. I mean, I, I was not um, academically inclined whatsoever. Um, I scored in the bottom percentile of the SAT. I couldn't recall one thing I learned in high school because I never had to learn in high school. Teachers gave me grades and shuffled me along because I was a star athlete. And so when I got to college, I didn't know how to read well. I didn't know how to write well. Um, the first time I went to college, I dropped out. Um, um, after I suffered a career and a knee injury, I had no purpose for being in school. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I had no interest in school. And so I became a dropout and ended up working in a vitamin factory on an assembly line for two years. Um, I ended up going back to school, but, but I was on the verge of dropping out again because I was severely illiterate, you know, and um, it, it wasn't until I had one professor um, who, who really knew how to meet me where I was. And, and, and she did that um, after she caught me cheating on an essay. Um, and, and after she caught me cheating, I had a very powerful moment with her, um, where she made a commitment to teach me how to read and how to write. And she would meet me at the local bookstore, um, every weekend for an entire year, you know, outside of office hours, outside of class time. And she would teach me how to read, teach me how to write. But, but, but the way she did that. Um, it, it, it profoundly demonstrate what it means to meet people where they are and how she further tapped into my potential. Because when she wanted to teach a young black man how to read, you know, she didn't go back to the standard English major curricula. You know, she didn't go back to Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner and, you know, Shakespeare and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Flannery O'Connor and all that good stuff, right? She introduced me to black writers like Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X. And, and the reason why that was so powerful for me, Chris, is because I didn't know that Black people could be scholars. You know, that, that's, that's not how I grew up. You know, the Black people I grew up around were drug dealers, they were gang members, they were athletes. And so that's what I aspired to because that's what I had access to. And, and that's why one of the things that I tell people all the time is that representation is the lens through which we dream. Representation is the lens to which we aspire because you can't be what you can't see. And so for me, you know, I didn't see black scholars in my community. I didn't see black scholars in my textbooks or on my television. So I couldn't aspire to it because I didn't have access to it. Um, but but what she did in that moment, man, was she uh she she helped me understand this psychological term um called latent learning, which which basically says that uh, for, for some people, um, potential and true abilities don't surface until they have an incentive to do so. So think about that, like that, that that's so powerful when we come, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, talent cultivation is that we, we are, we could encounter people every single day who don't look very talented, but they could have some of the most talented proclivities that are latent on the inside of them. And, and they just need the right incentive to be able to surface and show people what they can do. You know, and so that was the case for me. And it turned out I actually wasn't illiterate. It turned out I actually wasn't dumb. It turned out I didn't actually have learning disabilities. You know, I was just simply disengaged, you know, and, and, and there's a difference between, you know, being inept and being disengaged, you know? And so I think that's our responsibility. She taught me not just what it meant to be a teacher, but what it meant to be a leader. 
And, and that is our responsibility as leaders is to engage people. How do we engage people? By meeting them where they are. That's awesome. And just from your perspective, how did you turn your tenacity, your how you work so hard to become a student athlete, to become a student? You, you shared a little bit in a book, but how did you even do it? Because for a lot of people to just give up and do something else, what, what was in you and how did you spur yourself to really execute your will to do that? I, I, honestly, brother, it, it's, it's, it's because of my upbringing as an athlete. You know, I, I always, you know, I always say, imagine if scholars were trained like athletes. Uh, you know, when when I was an athlete, that's when I learned grit. That's when I learned resilience. Um, and that's when I learned ownership. And, 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 and what I mean by ownership is, you know, I talk about in the book how I had a coach who, you know, I learned very early I was never going to be the, the, the tallest player on the court. And, and there were times that I would gripe about my own disadvantages. How many of us do that? And just, just in life in general, how many of us look at what we don't have? How many of us look at our circumstances? How many of us, I mean, to, to be honest with you, there's no such thing as equality. They're, they're, they're just, they're no, nobody is equal, right? We, we all are born uh, under circumstances that we did not choose. We, we all have, you know, um, you know, certain resources that other people don't have and you know, some of us lack in ways that other people do not, you know, and so, you know, for, for, for me, my, my coach instilled within me a sense of responsibility athletically that I had no idea was going to transfer to my education later on. But, but I remember, you know, I, I would, I would, I would sit on the bench, you know, and, and I would kind of lament, you know, sitting petulantly whenever my, my shot would get blocked because I was annoyed by the fact that, you know, the, the, the centers and power forwards and that they were all significantly taller than me. And, and, and I was faster than them, you know, many of them, I was stronger than them. Um, but I wasn't as tall as them. And, and I remember one time he, he looked at me and he had, he said, you know, why are you looking like that? And, and I started complaining and he looked at me, he said, listen, we don't complain, son. We compensate. We, we don't complain. We compensate. In other words, he put the ball in my court and said, what are you going to do about your own disadvantages? You know, and, and, and that shaped me psychologically because when I got to college and, and I found that I struggled to read and I wasn't as uh, seemingly as smart as the other students, um, that, that concept, that philosophy came back to mind. And I said, you know, what am I gonna do about my own disadvantages? And so I started making some decisions. And uh, one of the decisions I made, um, I actually decided one time I went back to my dorm room and all my roommates were, were in there, you know, and they were playing, you know, my video game, my PlayStation. And I went in there and, and I unplugged it. I unplugged the PlayStation. I unplugged the television. And I announced to all my roommates that I was selling it. Um, I took my PlayStation, my television, every form of entertainment that I had. I sold it and I used that money to buy books to teach myself how to read. You know, I was that committed, but I mean, I, I understood that level of discipline and that level of regimentation because of my athletic years. Um, so, so I understood what it took to, to recondition my body at one point. And, and I knew that I could use the same principles to recondition my mind. And so that that's how I was able to, reinvent myself um, in, into a scholar. And were you always a strong athlete growing up and from a young age, Brandon? Or when did you realize you were so much better than most people out there? Yeah, um, you know, I was uh, very early, you know, I was you know, recruited even when I was in middle school to play um, varsity basketball for AAU, you know, um, the, the travel league. You know, I was... Um, I was 13 years old playing with the uh, 17, playing on the 17 and under team, you know, and um, so I learned very early that, that I was uh, gifted, but it's because I, you know, I put in a lot of work, you know, there, there, there are some people who are innately gifted and then there are some people who, who really have to work at it. Um, now I, I was both, you know, I think that there's a quote that says uh, that talent beats uh, or hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, you know. And so uh, for, for me, you know, I had natural gifted athletic abilities, but at the same time, um, I had to work very hard to, to compensate for, 
you know, the disadvantages that I had particularly, uh, you know, in height. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah, I, I learned pretty early that I was a, a, a gifted ball player. And there was, there was a question from the audience earlier was talking about how perhaps you overcame a lot of your challenges. The question was around COVID, a lot of people overcoming challenges, but your book, you talked about the upbringing you had, whether it's your stepdad, your sister's friends, a lot of personal things that happened to you. How did you overcome all these things? What advice do you have for people trying to overcome such adversity? Yeah, just to uh, provide a little bit of context, you know, my my childhood was filled with trauma. You know, I grew up in a home with a um, a stepfather who was a Baptist preacher by day, but by night he was a cocaine addict, and he tormented me and my siblings. And you know, I grew up in a home that was filled with abuse and drugs and violence. Um, and, and that manifested in my life in a lot of, uh, in the most unhealthy ways possible as I was growing up. And, and to be honest with you, Chris, you know, I'm not one who's going to sit here and, and make it seem like I have it all figured out because I don't, you know, I take it day by day. You know, people ask me, um, all over the world, you know, when I wrote this book, you know, they asked me and say, you know, did, did, did writing this book bring a sense of healing for you? And I tell them, no. It, it did not, you know, to, to be honest with you, um, it, it actually made things a little bit worse <laughs> because, you know, it was like ripping the bandage off. You got to understand my family and I had never talked about this stuff. Um, in order to write that book, I had to interview my siblings. I had to interview my mother. And these are things, you know, here I am. We haven't talked about this stuff ever, you know, since I was a child. You know, so here I am bringing up stuff from 20 years ago and my fame is like, wait, you want to do what with this information? You want to share this with the world? You know, and so it, it, it was actually me ripping the bandage off of wounds that were covered for decades, you know. And um, so I, I share with people candidly, did writing this book heal me? No. But what it did do is, is it allowed me to start the process of healing. You know, and, and the truth of the matter is the, the advice that I would give people is that we cannot heal from the things that we are too afraid to confront. And, and, and there's so much in our communities that are taboo, that we don't like to talk about. And a lot of us suffer in silence. Um, but, but the fact that I told my story is what allowed healing to begin for me. And I think it's the same with, with most of us, you know, when, when we begin to share our story, because you know what truly brings healing, it's not the, um, the articulation of the story necessarily. Um, what brings me healing is when I go on the road and I meet people who read my book and they look me in my, in, in my eyes and they have tears in their eyes and they say, your story inspired me to tell my own. That's what brings healing its impact. And, and, and I think at the end of the day, that's what all of us are chasing. So how, how am I healing? How am I growing? How am I developing? Um, by, by finding a way to repurpose my pain. You know, all, all of that pain that I went through, it, it, it would mean nothing if I didn't use it constructively. You know, um, I, I would just be like, why did I have to go through all that? But but now I can find a way to put that pain and those experiences to constructive use um, by 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 using those experiences uh, to teach young people that that they can live better lives. And I think that's what all of us are called to do. And I think it's incredible and, and well ordered that you chose to write the book to share with your students to help them lead different lives. But there's something, there's some strength in you found to do that. Yeah. Did it come innately that you just want to help these students that to help them along, you knew you had to tell more of your story? Was there anything else that you had to address internally and say, look, I'm going to do this because I want to help my students. But when I think of how all of us should be inspired to do something else, whether it's to leave their job or to start a company or to go on a different path, they need to find it within themselves to do something really special, right? And you did something. Really yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, you know, what we all struggle with, you know, is, is finding our purpose. You know, at some point or another, we're, we're all trying to figure out why am I here? Well, what am I supposed to do with, with my life? 
And I think one of the ways that, that we can help discover our purpose is to be for others what we once needed. Um, that that's what brought me gratification. That's what made me not just feel happy, you know, because, you know, ha happiness um, derives from happenings. It's, it, it's, it's circumstantial. It's, it's when certain it's, it's centered or happiness is centered around events. You know, it's, it's fleeting. It, it comes and it goes depending on what event is occurring. But fulfillment is different. You know, I didn't feel fulfilled un until I discovered my ability to make other people's lives better, you know? And, and I draw from my experiences, both positive and negative, you know, to, to and I offer those experiences to my students to, to be a compass for, for the places that they don't have to go. You know, some people say experience is the best teacher. I disagree. I, I think teachers are the best teachers. And I think every single one of us um, are teachers in some capacity. Um, if, if we are tasked with directing somebody else toward a particular goal and, and in providing that direction, oftentimes we're using, we're, we're drawing from our own experiences to tell them, hey, uh, you don't have to make this decision because I made this decision and here was the impact. Let me offer that to you so you can circumvent some of those negative decisions that I had and have a shortcut on your way to success. Think about the impact of that, you know? And so I, I think that's profound. I think that's beautiful. Um, I think that's a part of life that that makes us, you know, I think that's a form of power when you realize how much you can en enrich other people's lives. Um, and ultimately, I think that's what brings us a sense of fulfillment. One of your recent interviews, you mentioned about how all of us are, have some sort of addiction and we're addicted to something. And in some ways, we now just get addicted to work. Can you share more about how to make how you make sure you're not too addicted to work and just become a workaholic? You know, I, honestly, Chris, I don't know that I do, <laughs> you know, um, but I think it's something that I'm figuring out. And 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 the thing is, all of us, we we are united in this common anguish called humanity, which means that, Chris, you and I grew up in completely different environments. We come from two completely different cultures, but you know what both of us can identify with? Pain, pain. We, we, we all feel it, we all experience it. We're all trying to figure out this life. And also we all have the same tendencies. Um, be, because I think the most successful people that you find, um, I think one of the keys to success is the tolerance of pain. That, that's what's different between me and the crackhead is, is that I choose to respond. I find constructive ways to respond to pain, whereas the, the drug addict might find less constructive ways to respond to pain. You know, and, and and I've been both. The reason why I can I can share this is because I've been in both positions. You know, um, when when I was younger, I, I was uh, severely addicted to drugs. You know, and and the reason why is because I did not know how to manage the pain that I was experiencing. Um, and, and that's the case with so many different people. You know, and some people use uh, you know narcotics as their drugs some people use alcohol as their drugs something that will sedate the pain something that will help them get through challenging moments you know some people use uh, sex some people use violence and some people use work um, why because it allows us to throw ourselves into something else so we don't have to uh, focus on what troubles us and uh, I find myself doing that uh, from time to time and, uh, until um, sometimes I just have to sit still and, and make the decision um, to confront what I'm feeling, you know. And um, I think whenever we are faced with ad um, adversity and faced with those types of experiences and feelings, we have to make the decision to go through it, um, not to try to avoid it, you know, not to try to pacify it. Um, but to embrace it, allow ourselves to feel it, acknowledge it for what it is, and and find constructive solutions. 
incredible. I think something which you did in terms of setting up the Saturday school to allow people to come and learn in, in that specific way was an incredible impact to that society that, that has now grown. If you were to go back to your own childhood and perhaps see someone like yourself, what should they have done and could have done differently? It was You were stuck in a very tough situation from what I read. Was there any other outlet that you could have found or done differently? And you know, um, I had an outlet in basketball. Um, mm. I had an out. I had an outlet in drugs. I had an outlet in violence. the The problem is not a shortage or a dearth of outlets. The problem is a um, lack of accessibility to healthy outlets you know um some people are privileged to be exposed to positive outlets such as debate you know i i wasn't exposed to it when i was younger you know but maybe it could have changed my life or you know other types of programs you know as i was talking to my staff the other day you know because you know one of my colleagues she grew up in, in similar conditions, you know, she grew up in in, in the streets of, of of Brooklyn, New York, but she had a very different path than me um, because she said her her mother was adamant about putting her in the right programs that would help her get ahead. Programs that my mother knew nothing about because it wasn't a part of her world. It wasn't the language that she spoke, you know. So it's it's really about um, privilege. Honestly, is about people. It's, it's about the people who are in our lives that we have access to. Um, so I think that's where it begins. That, that, that's what changed my life was when I encountered the right people who knew how to impact me in positive ways. And so honestly, you know, when I look back on when I was young, um, you know, my, my life was ruined because of the people who were in it. My life was also saved because of the people who were in it. Hmm. And so I guess the solution is to try to scale access to these things into these that's people. what it is. That's what it is, man. That, that, that's what my work has uh has has demonstrated. You know, these kids, um, you know, that that I've taught the, the reason why they're studying now in the best colleges around the world, the reason why they're having such impact out here in society is because access was created for them. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that that's what we all need. So let's talk about the work now. And what what could the Zoogler community do to help you with what you're building right now? And what do you need from all of us and other people who are hearing this conversation? Yeah, you know, relationships, relation. It, what we are developing is a a movement that is preparing young people um, for the workforce, not not just to enter the workforce, but to have impact when they enter the workforce. And so we are building a school that is centered around college and workforce readiness. Um, mm -hmm. Our philosophy is that we don't learn for the sake of knowing, we learn for the sake of doing. And, and so that that's actionable learning, which means I'm not just concerned with the information and the knowledge that you have, I'm concerned about what you can do with that information. And so what, what we need is exactly what we're talking about right now, Chris, it's access. You know, and the people in the Zuba community have have access to opportunities that that our students need. And so I would love for for you all to to stay connected so we can um, continue those conversations to figure out where are some places that we can plug our students um, to be able to get some of the experiences that they need to be able to hone their gifts and their talents to ensure that they are prepared to thrive when they enter the workforce. In terms of the partnerships you're looking for, is it people who can hire them, mentor them, um, provide uh, situations where they can come also do perhaps uh, some teaching? All, 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 all of the above. You know, um, I, I think we can have, though, for those who are interested, I think it starts with interest. You know, so those who are interested in being a part of the work that we're doing, um, please, you know, reach out and we can start conversations around what all of our needs are. Um, and then, you know, our partners can determine how they can help meet those needs. So I have one last conversation before we turn this into the non-recorded part of uh, this, this session. Questions around the 
Lynn and Charles Schusterman uh, Family Philanthropies and the Reality Program have brought us together on this advisory board. Uh, what have they done for you and what, what should we share more about about that organization because without them we wouldn't have met and we wouldn't be oh able to man all. man everything everything is you you know going back to i i tend to focus on you know when we uh, deal with people from different cultures from different parts of the world i focus on what's most similar about us suppose of what's most different about us and, and one of the things that's most similar about every single one of us is we all desire the same thing, connection. Connection, we all want to be connected. Um, everybody wants to be a part of, of a community where they feel valued, um, where they feel heard, where they feel loved. And that's what the Schusterman Foundation has created. Um, it's created a community of like-minded individuals. Man, when we came together, it was just, it was synergy, man. Just, I mean, just all, all the people in our group. I mean, we we've known each other for for a finite amount of time, but but we feel like family because really, family is not about the amount of time you've spent together. It, it's it's about the experiences that you've had together. And, and, and when it comes to bonding people and connecting people, I don't think anyone does that better um, than, than reality, you know, bringing us into spaces where we feel um, like, like an impartation has been made, you know, where we walk away feeling empowered and equipped and enriched, you know, it's, it's, it's so beautiful, man. It's something that I would, would encourage every single person to, to be a part of if they can. And folks, it's a one-week program, the reality program, where you get to go to Israel with about 30 to 40 other individuals who are leaders in their own field. They usually put together a group based on interests. And so if you want to apply, Google that application or reach out to myself or Brandon, we can probably refer you to that as well and share more information. Um, Brandon, before we stop this recording, how can people reach out to you, your organization, if they want to contribute or to partner with you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking, brother. Um, I'm on all social media platforms at BP Fleming. Um, if you want to reach out and, and, and start a conversation about what it looks like to, uh, to partner um, with us in the work that we're doing, um, please reach out info at bpfleming.com. Um, we would love for you to be uh, one of our partners in equity. You know, as we build something that the world has never seen, that's going to make an indelible impact on black and brown communities. Um, so we welcome any, any invitation or any interest, you know, in partnering with us. Please reach out. We'd love to talk to you. Great. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, everyone, for joining this first part of the session with Brendan Fleming. Thank you again.